next, uh, we have to move on to our last speaker, Matthew Abs, who is a professor at University of Birmingham, where he leads the Motivation and Social Neuroscience Lab. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, I'm seeing a lot of fatigued faces. So um, persist, stick with me for one last talk. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, particularly as um, during the poster session, uh, someone described to me that this place is the mecca for effort. Um, and so it's really a real pleasure to get to give a talk whilst I'm on my pilgrimage. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work that is um, now going to be quite familiar to you about talking about how we make effort based decisions and how fatigue can affect this. But in my work, we're really talking about a slightly different component of fatigue that we think, which is this changes in fatigue from moment to moment whilst we're doing tasks. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction because you've already heard most of these concepts, but we uh, are really interested in how people make decisions about whether to exert effort to obtain rewards. And although we don't know everything about the neurobiology of this, what we do know is that if you um, deplete dopamine, so if you give dopamine antagonists to animals, then they're less willing to put in effort, such as press a lever to obtain rewards. We know that in dopamine depleted Parkinson's disease patients, that they're less willing to exert effort to obtain rewards. So it's clear that if you boost the dopamine system or you antagonize the dopamine system, you can manipulate how willing uh, people are and animals are to exert effort. And anatomically speaking, here in the Mecca and also in my lab, we've done lots of work to reveal uh, some of the systems in the brain that are engaged when we're making these decisions about whether to exert effort. And this anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior insula, the lateral frontal cortex, and the ventral striatum seem to be important regions for making these decisions. And activity here is often shown to be signaling the value, the subjective value of exerting effort to obtain rewards. Now, how can we assess people's decisions of whether to exert effort? Well, Marika's talk nicely set this up to where what we do is we give people lots and lots of trials where they have to make decisions about whether they're willing to obtain some, put in some effort to obtain reward. And typically in these experiments, what well, people are given a choice where they um, have uh, to do something that's quite effortful to obtain a large reward, or they can switch to an alternative, which is doing something very easy, not requiring much effort, for them, but will only get a much smaller reward. And the way we typically manipulate effort um, in these experiments is through physical effort. So um, we get people to squeeze these grip force devices to work out their maximum grip strength or maximum voluntary contraction. And then we set different percentages below that as the different levels of difficulty or different levels of effort in the task. And when you do this, as we've already seen, you find that people don't like exerting effort. So as the amount of effort required increases, people are less willing to accept that offer. They're more willing to do, more likely to switch to do something that is easier, but will get them less reward. Now, computationally, um, typically we use quite simple models to try and characterize the mechanisms that are under, uh, underlying these choices. So typically we use these kind of discounting models like you can see here, where what we assume is that rewards um, are in R in this equation are discounted by effort. And typically we assume that that's nonlinear. So we have it, the effort level squared. And that's typically what you find. You find the relationship between effort and reward is parabolic when it is physical effort. And so that gives you a sort of subjective value curves that look like this. So as the reward goes up, the value of the, uh, uh, sorry, as the effort goes up, the value of the reward decreases or is discounted. And so this is why you can have uh, uh, pe people who are willing to do some levels of effort for lower rewards, but for this particular person, they're very motivated and they'll do almost any amount of effort for, for a particularly large reward. And in these models, we then try and characterize individual differences in how willing people are to exert effort for a reward with this discounting parameter K or kappa, which when it's higher, it is somebody who discounts reward by effort to a greater degree. So this person is less motivated than this person, and so they'll have a higher K. And that's the kind of basic approach that most people take at the moment to examining effort-based decisions. Um, but I'm going to argue that um, this work, including by, uh, sorry, some work by this guy, Apps, who um, clearly is wrong, as I'm going to explain, um, is that effort-based decisions are not static. How we process effort is not static. It constantly changes across whilst we're doing a task. And we've actually known this idea for many, many decades, which is if you give someone quite a difficult task, they're... Um, uh, over time, their performance will decline. So they'll, people get slower in their movements, they get less accurate, there's less vigor to their behavior if they're doing a more difficult version of a task than an easier one. 
And this is kind of actually all embedded in cognitive psychology. We know this, right? Because we all give people breaks during experiments, because if we don't give them breaks, then they do really badly at the task. In fact, this concept is so embedded that even Chris Summerfield's neural nets are now given the opportunity to take a rest during his experiments. And you can see here that this happens on quite rapid timescales. So we've heard about how there's a component of fatigue that really happens when you really exhaust people, like in Matthias's lab, where he gets them to do things for six hours um, to really exhaust them and see the effects pre and post. But some aspect of this fatigue is clearly happening on a very short timescale. It's happening on the order here of minutes. And so what we were interested in doing then is trying to build a, a computational model that could try and explain how fatigue rises and falls from moment to moment how that can change people's motivation, so how that influences their decisions to exert effort, and then using that those computational models to try and understand a bit better about the neural mechanisms that underlie the processing of effort and people's motivation to exert effort for reward. Okay, so what would a computational model of fatigue need to look like? Well, fortunately, again, here in Mecca, we've already come up with lots of um, different components of fatigue that we can try and look for and that we can try and include within our model. And so here I'm just providing a sort of toy schematic of what a model of fatigue is going to need, uh, it might look like based on the existing literature. And the idea here is that there are two components to fatigue. There is a recoverable component and an unrecoverable component. So the recoverable component is this thing that's going to bounce up around, up, up and down whilst you're doing an experiment. So if you do something really effortful, so you exert a high effort, this fatigue is going to go up quite a lot. So a really difficult trial, fatigue goes up a lot but it can be restored. If you give them a break, or if there's long durations between trials, this fatigue come back, comes back down. And that's why when we give people cognitive experiments, we give them breaks, is because we know that fatigue is at least partially recoverable. But not all aspects of fatigue are immediately recoverable during a task. As we saw uh, in the nice talk earlier, if you exhaust people for six hours, they are always going to be more tired at the end than they were at the beginning. And even if you gave them long breaks, there's not the, it's not clear that they would easily be able to restore this level of, level of fatigue. So there's a component of fatigue that is, we call it unrecoverable. And I mean unrecoverable just in the context of the task, not that once you've done a task, that's it for the rest of your life, you're exhausted. Although sometimes it might feel like that. <laughs> So our model then needs to have three different parameters that can explain how each of these things are going to um, it, uh, differ between participants in how much their fatigue is going to fluctuate around moment to moment during experiment. And then we simply feed that into an effort discounting model like you can see on the right here, where what we assume is that as fatigue increases, it increases the extent to which you discount rewards by effort. So that can explain why when you're very uh, when you're not fatigued at all, there's particular amounts of reward for particular amounts of effort that you're very willing to do. You'll say, that's worth it. I'll definitely do that behavior. But the same behavior for the same reward, you won't be willing to do at another point in time when you're much more fatigued. So basically, whilst the originally that, that graph showed a solid line was one person and the dotted line was another person, now it's the same person at different points in time in the experiment. These subjective value curves are really constantly bouncing around as a function of how fatigued somebody is. Okay, so how can, uh, so that's basically going to be reflected in the fact that then we just basically change the discounting parameter throughout the experiment as a function of fatigue. So how can we test uh, this kind of model? Well, we did, shockingly, an effort-based decision-making experiment, where on each trial, participants making a choice between two options. One option is a rest, which is indicated by just one element in the pie chart there. And all that means is they're going to spend five seconds on this trial where they don't have to do anything. And if they choose to do that, they're going to get a very small reward, which is one credit. And they're choosing between that rest option and a work offer. And the work offer is going to vary on every single trial in terms of how much effort is required and how much reward can be obtained. And here we've operationalized efforts where what participants have to do is squeeze one of these grip force devices to a required level for three seconds out of a five second period. Now there are two phases to this experiment. There's what we call the pre-task and the main task. In the pre-task, what they get given is a wide range of combinations of reward and effort for the work offer. So the work offer could vary between 30% and 66% of their maximum voluntary contraction. Um, and it can vary in terms of reward between two and 10 credits. But during this pre-task, only 10% of their choices will they actually have to exert the effort if they choose to do it. So what this task allows us to do is to measure the extent to which a participant discounts rewards by effort in a situation where they're not particularly fatigued. So they're not gonna be getting exhausted during this uh, part of the task. <laughs> 
Then in the main task, there's a couple of differences. So firstly is now you can see they only get slightly different offers. They only get the offers in the top right hand corner of that box there. So they get offers that are really good in value. So they're high in terms of credits, six to 10 credits. So they don't get two to four credits and they're low in terms of effort. So it's 30% to 48% of their maximum grip strength. Now, the reason we do this is because we want to see a situation, if we want to see the effects of fatigue and be convinced that it's having a big, big effect on their choices, it should be in options where they would normally do it if they're not fatigued. This is really worth it when I'm not tired. And so if we see a change in their behavior during the experiment for these really high value options, we can convince that fatigue is having quite a big effect. And the other difference is that they don't get any breaks now in this experiment. Every time they choose to work, they have to exert the effort for reward. And every time they choose to rest, they get a five second break. And there are no breaks at all. So here, if they want to rest, they have to choose to do so. OK, so using this experiment, we can very simply look at the behavior uh, and firstly test if we see any effort discounting like you'd expect. And so this is the data from the pre-task. And in this heat map, I'm showing light colors are where people accepted the offers to a high degree and darker colors is when they uh, rejected that offer. And what you can see is there's a classic effort discounting effect. Uh, people were willing to work when it was high in reward and low in effort, and they were not willing to work when it was low in reward and high in effort. So they were discounting rewards by the effort in the pre-task. But what you can see is in this, uh, in this box here is the offers from the main task. And you can see is in the pre-task, they were accepting these almost all the time. So almost 100% of the time they were accepting these offers. So these high value offers really were worth it when they're not fatigued. And now we can plot the same offers from the main task. So this is exactly the same offers you see in the top right um, box. That's in the pre-task and in the bottom is in the main task. And as you can see, now their behavior's changed. So now they are discounting levels of reward, uh, reward for levels of effort uh, to a greater degree where they're now rejecting those offers when they weren't in the pre-task. So there's been a change in their valuation of the reward and effort here. But you could say, as we heard earlier, this is, could just be just range adaptation. The options have been, uh, you've, you've offered are different, so they change their behavior and just do that consistently throughout the main task. Well, if you look at the first 27 trials compared to the last 27 trials, you can see it's clearly not just a, uh, just a range adaptation across the whole task. What you can see is that in the first 27 trials, there's a little bit more effort discounting going on the, compared to the pre-task. But in the last 27 trials of the experiment, there's a much more dramatic shift in people's decisions. Now, that's a sort of proxy for what our model um, is, is trying to, to get at, but we can more directly fit it uh, to the participants' behavior. And when you do that and compare it to simpler alternative models that either assume that valuation is constant across the task or that only one component of fatigue or the other exists, uh, you can see that that full model I outlined is the best at explaining participants' choices in this task. So that suggests that there is this recoverable and this unrecoverable component to fatigue that influences people's decisions of whether to exert effort for reward. But the next question you might ask is, is that actually fatigue? Um, and obviously what we're doing there is just looking at changes in people's choices and assuming that it's fatigue, but is it actually participants would feel more fatigued uh, in line with how our model um, predicts? So to test that second uh, question, we did a very similar task. Um, uh, the same levels of effort and the same rewards, but there was two key differences here. One was now, rather than giving them a choice, they were forced to either exert effort or take a rest. So they were given the same effort levels, but they had to do it. There was no choice there. And people were actually were very successful at doing this because they did get uh, rests on 25% of trials. So there was uh, plenty of time to take breaks. Um, and the second thing is that rather than having a choice is they had to do a rating. So they rated between zero and 100, how fatigued, how tired they felt on each trial. And they did this on every single trial. So we can then see if uh, the, the so participants ratings of fatigue during the experiment fluctuated with the different components of our model. Um, so firstly, here you can see this is just um, the uh, ratings, average ratings of fatigue across participants across the 120 trials of the experiment. And in perhaps the least surprising rejection of a null hypothesis ever, uh, fatigue ratings went up over the course of the experiment, making them squeeze hard makes them more tired. But what we can do is look at the change in fatigue ratings from one trial to the next as a function of what they've done. So we can see here that uh, when we look at this change in fatigue ratings, that uh, when effort, the amount of effort they've exerted increased, their fatigue ratings increased compared to the previous trial. And when they've spent five seconds resting for on a trial, their fatigue ratings decline. 
Uh, so that would fit with this idea that fatigue is fluctuating on a moment to moment basis. And again, we can then perform model comparison and show that these fatigue ratings are fluctuating trial to trial in the manner predicted by our full model compared to these simpler alternatives. Okay, so now we can um, use this task inside the MRI scanner and ask where, uh, what systems in the brain might be tracking these different components of fatigue. So we can look at activity time lot to when people were making these decisions to exert effort for reward. And we're gonna fit the two different components of fatigue, the recoverable and re unrecoverable. They're trial by trial uh, estimates of these two features of fatigue uh, to see if anywhere in the brain is parametrically tracking uh, these two variables. And what you'll see here, apologies for these figures. Uh, um, when you transfer this from a Mac to Windows, apparently Microsoft doesn't like individual data points. Um, so there are all beautiful individual data points on here. Um, what you can see here is that these two different components of fatigue were being tracked by two different areas of the medial frontal cortex. So in the dark blue here was a region in which activity was scaled with that unrecoverable component of fatigue whilst people were making effort-based decisions. And that lighter blue color there was uh, tracking the recoverable component of fatigue. So activity there was constantly fluctuating as a function of people exerting effort or resting. And also, uh, Matthias will be very interested to see that that lateral frontal cortex region, exactly where he finds uh, all of those results um, uh, uh, for uh, when he exhausts people for six hours, we found tracked the unrecoverable component of fatigue, suggesting there is some overlap in terms of the mechanisms of that and what he's shown in his data. Okay, but what we can also extract from the model is trial by trial estimates of value. So here, we're going to look for subjective value at the time people are making effort based decisions. But crucially, it's a constantly changing subjective value as a function of reward, effort, but their current level of fatigue, for recoverable and unrecoverable fatigue that is changing their estimate of value. And what we found is this ventral striatum and this frontal polar region in which activity was scaled with subject the, the trial by trial changing subjective value. And intriguingly, in the ventral striatum, the three parameters from our computational model correlated uh, with activity in this region, suggesting that this region might be um, uh, uh, adjusting an individual participant's sen sensitivity to each of those components of fatigue and using that to guide decisions about whether to exert effort for reward. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is how we can use this model to potentially better understand fatigue in pathological uh, conditions. Um, but also whether we can see what the effects of dopamine might be uh, in terms of changing these momentary sensations of fatigue. So um, Parkinson's disease, of course, is a, considered as a disorder of motor control um, that arises due to dopamine depletion, but about 40% of Parkinson's disease patients suffer from chronic, uh, chronically severe fatigue. But we have very little understanding of the mechanisms why, and I think we've already heard today, we really don't know, understand the mechanisms of pathological fatigue that well. As I said at the start, what we do know is that when they're on dopaminergic medication, it changes their sensitivity or their willingness to exert effort for reward. So what we wanted to ask, though, is how does that relate to the different uh, aspects of momentary changes in fatigue that we've identified? And the nice thing about using this computational approach is we can ask whether changing dopamine levels in these Parkinson's patients might change whether uh, effort increases their fatigue ability or whether it might be that do uh, increasing dopamine allows them to recover more quickly once they become exhausted. So to test those idea those possibilities, we gave them that second task that I, uh, that I presented to you where they had to rate their fatigue on a trial by trial basis. And we tested 28 Parkinson's disease patients where we again forced them to exert effort to obtain reward or gave them rests on a quarter of the trials. And we tested them in two sessions in a counterbalanced order. Either they came in on their normal typical dopaminergic medication, which would be levod levodopa in most cases, or we tested them in uh, the same participants in another session in an off state. That was they would not take their morning dose of levodopa, which means they're approximately 12 hours since they've taken a dose, which means they're in a dopamine depleted state. And so what we can then do is look at whether fatigue ratings are, are, are different in the, uh, in the patients when they're on the medication or off. And what you can see is that there is a subtle but significant difference between fatigue ratings on versus off. It isn't present at the start of the experiment. So whether they're on medication or off, their fatigue ratings were equal right at the start. But over time, when they're off medication, their fatigue ratings are higher than when they're on, suggesting that dopamine might have a role in influencing uh, how fatigued participants actually feel themselves during this effortful task. But we can then look at the uh, parameters. Again, beautiful data points missing here. 
what we can see to compare is the parameters on versus off medication in these uh, in these group. And so we can see whether there is any significant difference uh, between any of these parameters. And what we found, there's only one of these parameters showed a significant difference which is that when these patients were on their medication, they had a higher rest parameter compared to when they're off their medication. And what this means is that when they're on their medication, they're recovering more on rest trials than when they're off their medication. But there was no difference in the other two parameters, suggesting that Parkinson's patients don't get fatigued more quickly when they're exerting, uh, when they're exerting effort, but once they become fatigued, they're less able to recover. And we can also see this in the actual uh, data. It's a little bit more uh, harder to see here, but if you plot uh, the changes in fatigue ratings from trial to trial, you can see that there's a, a, a more negative change in their fatigue ratings when they're on their medication compared to when they're off their medication. Okay, so um, that's, I'm just gonna summarize then what I've shown you, which is hopefully I've convinced you that fatigue fluctuates on a moment to moment basis. It does so as a function of this recoverable component of fatigue that constantly bounces around as a function of what you're doing during an effortful task. But there's also this unrecoverable component that perhaps just slowly builds across an experiment. Um, we've shown that those different components of fatigue might map on to different regions of the frontal cortex, but it also appears to be integrated in the ventral, stri uh, ventral striatum, leading to your decisions of whether to exert effort for reward as a function of how tired you currently feel. And lastly, by using this computational approach, we can we have shown that uh, uh, you can see that in Parkinson's disease patients, that dopamine boosts your uh, their ability to recover uh, and comp rather than making uh, reducing how fatigued they are by exerting effort. Okay, so I'd like to thank um, particularly Tanya. Much of this work made up uh, part of her PhD, and all the collaborators and funders that are part of this, and. Um, uh, just to say that I've been very lucky in the uh, grant roulette recently, and so I'm going to have a number of positions open over the next few months. So if you're interested, please do get in touch. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Matt. That was a fantastic talk. Very thorough set of experiments. So well done. Um, I just had probably a very pedantic question in terms of you do um, do quite a lot of squeezes during a session. Mm -hmm. Did you check for the 100% MVC? Did that actually drop over time? And did you recalibrate or? Uh, so... So that's a hard one to do, right? Because what yes. we do know is when people are less motivated is that their maximum grip strength can actually be lower, even though clinicians will traditionally, physiology, physiology clinicians will say that doesn't happen, but it definitely does. Um, what I will say is the levels of effort we're using here are actually really quite low in the main experiment. As I said, we use those three lower effort levels and they are far, far below maximum grip strength. Yeah, it's less than 50%, isn't it? Yeah, it's less than 50%. Um, so it is not it is never not the case that it is really, really difficult for them to do to, towards the end of the experiment compared to the at the beginning. Now, I'm not saying there's no motor component to this. I'm absolutely sure that variability in motor output is going to be one of the factors that drives these uh, the these fluctuations in fatigue. But I, I don't know if it's going to be affecting the maximum grip strength or not. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. That was a brilliant talk. Um, my, my question is about whether you think that fatigue is ever dissociable from motivation. Uh, we, we were having a chat during the lunch break and we, I, I can't imagine kind of you know, seeing patients, you see patients who are fatigued and I can't imagine seeing a patient who's fatigued, who isn't demotivated. But I do see clinical cases where people are, have a kind of pure apathy syndrome uh, where they don't seem to be fatigued, but they are demotivated. Do you think that you, this model is, you know, is always the case that fatigue plays part of if there are dissociable roles? So, so I'd say that it's almost always the case that for an individual person, that if then fatigue increases, their motivation will probably be more likely to decline. But I don't think there's a one-to-one -one mapping be between the two. So for instance, uh, another and you might call it pathological, but uh, athletes are a, a participants who will be able to, we were discussing this over the break, that are very able to report how effortful it is. They report being very exhausted during, during uh, their extreme exertions, but they stay motivated. And in fact, to be a good athlete, you probably need to decouple your sensations of fatigue and your sensations of effort from your willingness to keep persisting doing it. Um, now, in terms of path pathologically, I think um, unless someone is over-exercising, which might be a case of where some uh, some participants are decoupled and therefore have almost a pathological too high levels of motivation that has negative consequences. In 
in psychiatric and neurological conditions, you're probably unlikely to see it because um, because um, uh, the levels then they're not coming to you saying that they're exhausted and their normal levels of daily activity are really high, which I'm guessing as a clinician would not make you concerned about that individual. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was curious if you think uh, there might be some component of this um, re recoverable fatigue that's somehow related to like adapting to state. So like maybe the long, the unrecoverable fatigue is like real fatigue, but you need a moment every now and then to somehow accept this new state of a bit higher fatigue and then start fresh again. And that could also be related to some people's ability to recover uh, more quickly. Um, uh, yeah, the long answer is is yes and no. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say possibly not because we did that experiment with the fatigue ratings. Um, that there it's the case that their fatigue ratings fluctuate with the model, with the recoverable component and the unrecoverable. So, um, but let, maybe let's chat afterwards because I have a lot of a lot of thoughts about this. Yeah, Matthew, if, if I can ask a question, there's a an easy mapping that comes to mind between your two types of fatigue and central versus peripheral fatigue. So um, given the location you shows with the SMA in one case or, or DMPFC in one case and DLPFC in the other case. Uh, so my question is how much do you think of your recoverable fatigue could be related to changes in the muscle or in the periphery? Um, so that there's a there's a that's a great question that is um one way of answering well, that would, be, would be to see to do an experiment where you try to fit the same model to a cognitive ethics task such as when you're doing mathematical calculations and when you do that you find that the fatigue goes up much in line how you find it in the physical task and what you find is that uh, the same model does a pretty good job um of fitting to uh fitting to the data but we need this added component for cognitive tasks, which is when people make a mistake, their fatigue actually increases more. That's a side point to your question. But this model included the recoverable component and the unrecoverable component. Now, whether in a cognitive task, it might map onto a slightly different regions of frontal cortex, I don't know. I'm interested to find out. I would say that actually the, the interesting thing about the regions of the medial frontal we got is yes, they are sometimes implicated in having sort of uh, somatotopic representations, but you also see them in studies on metacognition um, and when people are making confidence ratings. And so there's a possibility that it's more along lines of representing internal states, and that might be internal states in terms of other brain systems or internal states in terms of bodily systems. Um, and that's what we're kind of picking up there with the recoverable moment is a, is a constantly fluctuation representation of your internal state. Thanks. I already have the mic, but I'll just wave with my hand. Um, I was struck by this result that you find in the in the PD patients that you see this effect only during the rest phase. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more also in relation to the effects that you find in the ventral striatum with this fatigue weighted um, subjective value. And one other part of that that I was wondering about is whether you, you also see any kind of like response perseveration in the Parkinson's patients while they're doing the task and whether that could factor in here also. So in those patients, they're doing the ratings task where they're forced to exert efforts. And so we don't, we wouldn't be able to see preservation because all we're getting from them is ratings and the grip force. Um, Sorry, I meant ratings perseveration, but they just keep saying. No, so we don't, we don't see, I mean, you can see it in the trends, but we don't see much ratings perseveration. Um, so um, uh, that we were actually concerned about that. So what we did is that normally you'd, to do the rating starting from a random starting point when you do these kind of experiments but that in and of itself might induce fatigue and you might have perseveration so the way you can see if it's perseveration is we just had it as the previous trials value um and so if they do not change it for multiple trials we'd be concerned that for we weren't inducing fatigue. Um, and you see that there are some plateaus in some participants but the vast majority are changing their ratings on almost every trial so we don't think that that's what it is, is rating perseveration. In terms of ventral striatum and uh, dopamine, uh, uh, that's complicated. Um, uh, my hunch is that this might be linked to this um, idea that dopamine is involved partially in signal to noise, controlling signal to noise ratio in, um, and that therefore if you boost dopamine, it means that 
areas, once you exert some efforts, you need to basically reset that system, allowing you to have a normal signal to noise ratio in that region. So if your dopamine depleted, it's fine when that region is functioning okay, but once you get to the point of being exhausted, and that reset's not happening as effectively, perhaps because glutamate has built up or something um, something like that, then that might be why if you don't have enough dopamine, you're not able to recover as much. But that's very much a hand wavy speculation, I guess, at this point.